All right, well, we can get started here. Um, it's 10 o'clock right on the nose. Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for, for day two. Um, I think hopefully we'll have a, a few more people jump in. I'll be sure to admit as we go on, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, today is science in buildings. So really applying all of the concepts from Tuesday's class um, into, you know, real building science case. Um, and yeah, I guess without further ado, Peter, I'll, I'll let you take things off. Thanks, Ian. So today is another about an hour and a half or so. I can stay a little bit later if we wanna do some questions, uh, if we can't get to them along the way. So yeah, as Ian indicated, we're, you know, I sort of laid out some groundwork, but the connections to buildings were a bit indirect. And now we're gonna kind of plunge into how to take these principles and work our way through building performance with both with a focus on the enclosure, but also integrating with mechanical systems. Um, so we're, we're gonna start looking at a couple of perspectives. And I like to do this because um, one of the key things about buildings to me is that there are always many lenses through which to look at how buildings work. And so a brief recognition of how different people have uh, shown real insight with buildings and you know, uh, wrapping up with my perspective on uh, the particular lens that I use. And then we're gonna go through uh, managing water, air, vapor, and heat, all those basic uh, physics that we learned in part one. Um, we're gonna take them to the nitty gritty of building uh, details. Um, but also we're going to you know, then move into buildings and systems as opposed to just assemblies, integration, mechanical systems and enclosure, spend some time looking at the importance of windows. And you know, since 3C REN includes three climates, no, four climates, we'll do a bit of looking at the impact on climate on priorities and then two high performance building case studies and resources. But first, um, you had homework. And uh, some of you actually did the homework. <laughs> so one, one that came up um, is very interesting. And uh, of course, this is up in an attic. Uh, we're taking a look at the uh, roof sheathing up against the trusses and it's LP tech shield, which is a radiant barrier structural sheathing. So you can see that there's, you know, half inch or so of OSB, but laminated to that on the underside on one side is a highly reflective metal layer, a laminate. So the questions are, you know, how is this foil faced OSB considered radiant barrier when the foil is attached to the OSB? There is no airspace on one side, although the foil has low emittance, doesn't have very high conductus, conductance. So if it's touching anything, will the heat be readily conducted there? And is this a misuse of the term radiant barrier? Those are all really, really good questions. So first of all, um, it is true that the metal coating is uh, highly conductive, highly reflective, and very low um, emittance. So how does that play out if we only have the reflective barrier on one side? Well, on the other side of the sheathing is the roof underlayment and the cladding. And there's no airspace between this uh, structural sheathing and those other layers. So that's why there's not a reflective coating on both sides. You would only want to put the radiant barrier or the low E coating on the side that faced empty space. Um, and indeed it does face the empty space of the attic. However, wherever something is touching it, like the uh, top cord of the truss, that's going to be conductance. So what you would think is that the surface temperature of the tech shield should be lower than it would be if there wasn't a low E coating, but you would expect there to be even a little bit of accelerated or higher conductance um, through the sheathing down to the top core of the truss. Now, A, that surface area, given the whole attic is not all that great, um, it's a very thin metal layer. So its impact on the overall conductivity of the material is uh, in the grand scheme of things, not all that great. Um, 
But another interesting thing about this tech shield is if you look closely, it's perforated. So there's this pattern of indentations. And that's another bit of a mystery, but of course, those are to increase the vapor permeability because that continuous sheet of uh, aluminum foil would act as a class one vapor retarder. So you can get um, a whole bunch of different uh, heat transfer properties and moisture transfer properties that are woven into the specific configuration of this sheathing. Um, but as soon as I saw this slide, I thought, man, I really want to compare it to um, the time that I was up in an attic and there was LP Tech Shield, um, but I was up there with my infrared camera. So uh, this is a attic very much like um, the one that the person who did their homework configured. Um, and so I wanna just show you what the, an infrared camera can tell us. So the roof that was in the last picture is for this house. And this is a house in Houston. Um, we were up in the attic at about 3.30 PM in July, 2018 with an infrared camera. And this is what the infrared image looked like. So um, I'm gonna to try to clear the bottom here. With this infrared uh, camera, um, I have to move out of the way and hold that to be able to see the information at the bottom. But notice um, it's July, the date's in the lower left-hand corner. Um, let's first of all start with the uh, temperature range. So the, when the camera see, is focused and is auto adjusting, it assigns light yellow or almost white to the warmest temperature and the deepest purple to the coldest temperature. Um, at the crosshairs, you get the temperature that's read out here. So what we know from this image, and by the way, this is the digital image with the infrared you know, in, in the middle of it. So you don't have to take a separate digital image uh, when you go back and look at these later. So this is of course, one of the webs of the uh, truss. Um, and uh, this is, you know, the dark blue is representing the highly reflective and low E uh, radiant barrier. So how does this work? Um, the roof cladding is black shingles. You couldn't pick anything better to be a solar absorber. So the temperature of the roof cladding, the temperature of the roof sheathing is quite high because it's two o'clock, you know, middle of the afternoon in July. So what that means is that the actual temperature inside the half inch OSB is going to be just as high as the roof cladding and probably in the 170 to 180 degree Fahrenheit range. But because there's a low E coating on the inside, whatever that temp energy content is of that sheathing, it, it's very reluctant to radiate it down. Now, clearly there's a lot of transmission going on because this member here, which is uh, part of the roof assembly, the, the, the truss, you know, that's gonna be warmer because it's conducting through. But the real mystery is in the middle of the uh, radiant barrier, you can see the temperature is down to 106 here. The, temp the air temperature in the attic probably was around um, 100 or so. Um, what, it, what is this? And why, look how warm it is. So whatever this is, it's changed the surface temperature properties in this particular location. And you'll see down at the bottom here, we have an epsilon 0.9. That means I can set the emissivity for the surface I'm reading. And this is interesting because, wait a minute, if I'm trying to read a radiant barrier, and the radiant barrier has an emissivity of say 0.05, why would I choose an emissivity of 0.9? Well, it's because I was targeting what was in the crosshairs. And I knew the emissivity of that spot was actually 0.9. Now I do have the background, the BG temperature wrong. I, when I was down below inside the condition space, I had it set for this temperature. I forgot to change it when I went into the attic, it should be at hundred, but actually, this is what's the difference between relative temperature differences and absolute temperature differences. The relative temperature differences in this infrared image are accurate, but 
because the background temperature was not set to 100 degrees, the absolute temperatures here are probably a bit off. But the bottom of the mystery. So this here is, th this image is taken right here. So why is it so bloody? That's the building sticker, right? That, that's, that's how they, that's the barcode sticker for um, the sheathing. So look at the impact there. We went from radiant foil, which has an emissivity of about 0.05, to a sticker, which has an emissivity of about 0.9. And look at the impact on the temperature difference. It's about 40 to 50 degrees different in the surface temperature, just because you changed the emissivity of that particular material. So what is, what's, what's the bottom line here? The bottom line here is that in really hot climates, and even in moderate climates that don't have a lot of uh, heating, a lot of wintertime temperatures, you can reduce the attic temperature a lot by using a radiant barrier. Now, when you get to colder climates, um, you, you, you don't get as much benefit. So when you get to about climate zone five in the um, uh, code system, that's when the cooling reduction you get from the radiant barrier is about equal to the heating uh, increase you get because if you if you have a radiant barrier during the, the the winter you're actually keeping this at a cooler and if it's in the bright sun during the winter it actually can get quite warm um, so simply using heat transfer principles um, to, to demonstrate how um, important it is in terms of the performance of different spaces in the building now you'll notice in both the photos, there were uh, uh, forced air ducts in the attic and this attic is not conditioned. And so the money they saved by using the radiant barrier was probably completely overwhelmed with how much the cooling was increased because those ducts have about R8 on them. And they're in an environment where the temperature of the attic is about 100 to 130 degrees. Um, the, the benefit of the radiant barrier is being almost completely eroded, if not overwhelmed by the fact that you should not have your uh, 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 forced air ducts in a hostile environment, um, the attic. So a great question. And uh, okay, so let's take a look at some perspectives. Um, and I, I pulled out these three because, um, and I use these at the beginning of every course that I teach, um, when I was designing a, a building science enclosure class for online for Boston Architectural College back in 2005, um, I realized there is no book that is designed for architects for building uh, enclosure science. So I called John Straub, whom we'll talk about in a minute, and he said, um, actually, Peter, there is a book. Uh, Linda Brock, who's a professor at the University of British Columbia in their School of Architecture, uh, through Wiley Press, just um, published a book called the Exter Designing the Exterior Wall. Um, it's a really great book if you're an architect or if you're not. It's a whole bunch of reasons why, but the main thing is the way that Linda looks at uh, the system. So she sees it as a complex system, the cladding and the structure, windows and doors, and then a series of barriers and retarders that mediate the environment. And here's the thing about being an architect. Um, all of these attributes of the enclosure have to be evaluated in terms of function, durability, appearance, and cost. So in my work, I don't have to worry about those last two at all. I'm solely fun focused on the functioning of the enclosure system and its durability. Architects have to wear many, many lenses in order to design a building that serves all of the priorities that the client has. I've only got to focus on a couple. So um, specialists, including engineers, um, don't have nearly the burden that architects do. And one of the things that Linda Brock is arguing is that uh, architects should not surrender responsibility for the performance of the enclosure to specialists. They should embrace the fact that if you don't integrate function and durability with appearance and cost, 
um, then you're likely to have a exterior enclosure that doesn't work the way that it should. And so she sees them as divided into four parts here. Um, uh, and again, this is uh, four things that the architect has to focus on, just as there were four in the first set of bullets. So I'm my hat's off to all architects. It's a very daunting task to add the lens of building science to all their other ways that architects have to um, evaluate building buildings and their performance. So another perspective I really like, uh, Stuart Brand is a philosopher. I think that's what he would call himself. He wrote a book called How Buildings Learn. And it, when I read this book, it really completely shifted the way I thought about buildings. Um, Stuart Brand thinks of architecture as uh, being one of permanence with a unchanging deep structure. Um, and he looks at buildings not just uh, in space or how they relate to their spaces, but he looks at them over time. And you know, since I was mostly a remodeler and did a lot of renovation where the time frame and the life of the building has a huge impact on how you look at changing its performance, um, I, I really like his way of thinking of buildings as unchanging in their deep structure, but then changing all the time over time. Um, uh, and that means that you need to um, think of the buildings in a different way. I also like this particular quote, uh, all buildings are all dressed up in dissimulation, buildings are so naked. And so what does that mean? What does dissimulation mean? I think I had to look that up when I first read this. What I think he's saying is, it is so easy to be distracted by the, the aesthetics of a building, the way that it looks, its proportions, um, the details of changes in plane. And what he says is that that sort of distracts us from thinking about how naked the building is if we also can penetrate through all those layers on the outside to the deep structure. Um, so great book. Um, and um, he base, uh, Stuart Brand bases his understanding of building enclosures on Frank Duffy's perspective, which is expressed here on the right. And you can see that Duffy talks about shearing layers and there's the deep structure, but over top of that are all these layers that have different service lives potentially than, um, than, the, uh, than the deep structure layers. And so, you often hear the term enclosure, you hear the term envelope, and you hear the term skin. Um, you know, the, the, these terms are mean different things to different people. But when I think of the building enclosure, I'm thinking of all of these layers. And in a lot of modern buildings, these layers have combined function. So yes, there are shearing layers of change, but if we, if we combine function, it means that the shearing layers are more integrated than they were in older buildings. And again, it's not just about change, it's about rates of change, it's about the building over time. And then finally, an engineer's perspective, uh, you know, the, this book in the upper right-hand corner, Building Science for Building Enclosures, it's 18 chapters. Um, it's for architectural engineers. And that's interesting because there are many uh, fields or subdivisions of engineering, civil, structural, um, mechanical. Uh, and John Straub is an architectural engineer. They're the only engineers who have been trained to use engineering principles specifically for buildings. And th that's a bit of a problem because there's no guarantee that a structural engineer or a civil engineer, or mechanical engineer is able to take the principles they learned and apply them to buildings as systems. Um, so we need more architectural engineers is what it boils down to. Uh, but John has a, it's also interesting to look at the language used. Stuart Brand as a philosopher uses real different terminology than John does as an engineer. Um, but as an engineer, John thinks of it as an environmental separator. And this, this is a bit of a, <laughs> a problem because 
we often want our buildings to be able to move and move easily from completely separating the interior environment from the exterior environment, but then being able to change easily to connect it to the unit. And I'm talking basically about mechanical systems that are heating and cooling and the building's entirely closed. And then it's a nice day and we need to turn off the mechanical systems and open up the windows. It's very, very difficult to do that, especially in commercial buildings. But the idea of environmental separation is really debatable as, because as hard as it is to make buildings that can move from uh, environmental separators to being open to the environment, it is a key function and particularly for your uh, three counties. And then he also thinks of different layers within the system. And the key is they are three-dimensional and multi-layered. So they're, they're very complex. Um, and we're gonna get back to that in just a second. Um, and by the way, I mentioned there were 18 chapters and I was starting to say that there are nine and nine. About nine of the chapters of that book are accessible to anybody in the building industry. And the other nine require differential equations and a really strong engineering background. So is it worth it if you're not an architectural engineer to get that text? Yes, um, because even though it's heavy slogging to go through, um, I find myself going back to John's book all the time to, to, to better understand how heat and moisture move through buildings. Remember we ended last time by talking about um, the fact that here's the heat transfer, here's the moisture transfer mechanisms, but how do the two relate? And that's what we're gonna start with today. How do moisture and energy move through buildings in a way that we can understand, track, and even change? So here's my perspective. Um, heat flow through building enclosures dries them out. So in the olden days, um, buildings got wet, but we didn't try to slow down either heat coming from the outside in or heat coming from the inside out. We just let them flow. Energy efficiency measures by nature reduce, reduce heat flow through building enclosures. I think you can see where I'm going here. Energy efficiency measures can and often do reduce drying potential. If you reduce the drying potential, you probably need to reduce wetting. And you know, for what it's worth, um, if the only thing you take away from this class is this one line, uh, the physics dictate that you must, it's not an option, you must manage energy and moisture with equal intensity. So for example, if there's a building that for 50 years has been managing energy and moisture in a certain way, and this happens in Vermont all the time, the weatherization company comes along and says, hey, we're gonna drill holes in your walls and fill it full of cellulose insulation. Now, if you fill that exterior wall with cellulose insulation, you have radically changed how much heat is moving through that system. And so if there was a small leak underneath a window that for 50 years has been getting wet and drying out and getting wet and drying out because energy from the sun moves readily through the system. Energy during the winter when the building's heating moves out of the system, but they're both drying the, the building. If you slow down that heat transfer, you better have done a better job managing that moisture. So, you know, as we try to improve the way buildings work, we have to honor this uh, unchangeable relationship between energy and moisture management. If we're gonna manage energy better, we have to manage moisture better. So how do we do that? Um, the drawing on the left is from Steve Basic. Um, I do an awful lot of training with Steve. He and I worked together at Building Science Corporation back in the early 2000s. Um, Steve was trained very young in age by both uh, Joe Stebrick and Betsy Pettit at Building Science Corporation from about 1994 or so uh, until he left in 2005 or so, so for 10 years. And uh, he's just a really great architect because he has completely added the lens of building science to the way that he uh, design and specs buildings. But the, the basic principle that we're gonna use is control layers. And those control layers have to be continuous. And we're gonna do the control layers in order of priority 
which is bulk water first, then air, then vapor, and then thermal. Now, thermals at the end. That means that insulation is the last continuous layer that we're going to design and spec into a building. And that's pretty much the opposite of the way that many energy codes and many of us ha have been trained to think about buildings, both in new construction and in retrofit. Um, so this is a bit topsy-turvy, but it means that if you manage the moisture better with these three, then it really doesn't matter how much you reduce the energy flow through the system. Um, so over here on the, uh, and again, I'm trying to, I think I'm gonna minimize this so I can get a better view of my screen. So on the right here, we just have a typical, you know, building. I just kind of picked it out of many that I could have, but I like the, uh, the three-dimensional sort of the isometric uh, photograph here. Um, managing these four layers in the middle of a wall system is pretty straightforward. The problem comes wherever there's a transition or a meeting of materials. So you can see up here at the top of the eave wall, especially on an outside corner, um, where a deck comes and meets this wall assembly. Uh, complex corner here, where not only do we have the roof and the walls, we have a double window here, making those details particularly different to get the continuity of these four layers. Um, where we have a walkout entryway, in, very similar to the deck, um, and at ground level. So that's where the all hell breaks loose in terms of the continuity of these layers. So many cross sections that we look at are about this part of the building. Um, that's complicated, but not nearly as complex as three-dimensional uh, expressions as opposed to planar, and then all of these places where there are transitions, penetrations, the margins of assemblies. And here you can see mechanical penetrations, another uh, you know, difficult one to keep all four control layers continuous. So one of the tools that we use to get the control layers continuous is called the pen test. And the pen test is you take your finger or your pencil or your cursor and you start at the bottom of the building and without lifting your pencil, your cursor or your finger, you make it from the bottom of the building all the way up to the top. Now, you're gonna be tempted to jump here at the top of the foundation wall where it meets the first above grade component. You're gonna be tempted to jump here at the sill of the window. You're gonna be tempted to jump at the head of the window and you're certainly gonna be tempted to make a jump of one of those four layers or more where the eave wall meets the roof assembly. So when I'm doing design spec reviews on buildings, um, this is what I, these are the tools that I, this is one of the primary tools I use. But remember, um, if I only do one cross section, then I'm only getting one slice through the building. So I go around looking for all those spots that I circled in the previous slide and tease them out. You know, one of the hard things with, that I have with architectural drawings are that they are two-dimensional and buildings are three-dimensional. And Anna Minster and I have talked about this before. I'm not terribly good at going from 2D to 3D. Um, it's a bit of a learning disability I have as a person who you know, evaluates building performance. I really have to work hard to move from sheet to sheet in a, a set of construction documents because the trick is to get them into 3D. Now, I'll, with um, now I'm gonna forget the name of the most common three-dimensional three modeling program, SketchUp. Um, I love to work with architects when they can provide me with SketchUp because that makes it a lot easier for me to see where I have to go look for continuity uh, in the building uh, control layers. Um, but the principle is the same here. I'm trying to find the continuity and the continuity is often gonna come with compatibility of materials at these hard spots. 
where there's a change from below to, to above grade uh, assemblies, sill, head, and um, where the wall meets the roof assembly. So we have this order of priority and these controllators, water, um, air, vapor, and thermal. Um, when we talk about water, we, we actually have to evaluate three types of water. And the first is groundwater. Groundwater is where there's a body of water where it's, if, it's, if the building is seeing it, we have to consider hydrostatic pressure. That, that is very different than looking at the surface water. Um, surface water is not generally under hydrostatic pressure. It may be flowing, it may be sheeting, um, but it's a, it's a topical uh, 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 flow of water that we have to deal with. And then the last one is the building water. You know, what, what's the load coming off the building, down the building, and then either into or away from the building? So we have three forces of water moving toward the building in bulk water form that we have to evaluate. So let's talk about groundwater first. So you can see here that when they dug this basement hole, they certainly weren't anticipating that it was going to fill up before they could come back the next day. It hasn't rained, by the way. Um, after they dug this hole, it simply filled up. Why? Because the groundwater table was above the bottom of their footing. Uh, if you have a body of water that is acting on your building, you now are building a boat, not a building. Um, you're going to have to completely change the way you think about managing water if you have groundwater. So this is the most difficult type of bulk water to manage. So the question is, well, well, how do I get information on groundwater? Well, my undergraduate degree is in agronomy. And so I knew that there was something called the Web Soil Survey. So every acre of land in the entire United States has been mapped which means that somebody dug a soil profile uh, 80 inches deep and completely profiled that soil. Uh, and it, sometimes the bedrock, right? Because if bedrock comes before the 80 inches, which is about seven feet, um, that's gonna be part of the soil profile. So this database is incredibly easy to use. It's for the entire United States. Um, it, it, the, the way that you use the web soil survey is by zeroing in on the area of interest that you have and then going to the soil maps. So um, I wrote a blog about this on greenbuildingadvisor.com. Um, that's a reference you should use. But I'm hoping that at the end of today's session, we can come back and I'll move out of my slide presentation and we'll pull up the web soil survey and um, I'll show you how it works. Um, so stay tuned on that, but a very powerful tool to use in 10 minutes. And, and by the way, when I get a new project, whether it's an existing building or, or new construction, one of the very first things I do is ask for the address. I go right onto the web soil survey and I pull it up and I look at what I can learn about where the groundwater table is and the drainage properties of that soil down to the bottom of the 80 inches. Incredibly powerful tool. Um, and uh, completely free to use. And then I put the uh, URL in here so that when you get the slide deck, you'll know where to go. But if you type web soil survey into your browser, you'll rock it right to this. All right, so the second water that we're gonna worry about is site surface water. Well, that's pretty simple. I just go and get a topo map of the site, right? So now I'm looking for where is the building located? Uh, where are different elements of the landscaping going to be? And is the water going to be moving towards my structure? And therefore, I have to develop techniques to intercept that water? Or can I locate the building in such a way that um, nature takes care of moving the site load away from my structure? Um, I think it was actually on this particular project where the nature of the soil survey that we looked at and the topo map, the, uh, the homeowner switched from a full basement to a slab on grade simply because of what they learned um, looking at uh, a, a good soil profile 
and also taking a close look at the topographical map. So we haven't even gotten to the building yet, right? We're evaluating how we protect against bulk water from sources that are, uh, you know, related to the site that Mother Nature has given us. So we're going to be looking, remember in part one, we looked at two buildings that were um, in the Tri-County area and one very close to the other, one was high performance and one wasn't. So I just went looking for some typical uh, buildings and ones that we had some information on. But, you know, you can see here that um, here's the location of this particular property. Um, and what I'm looking for is the topographical relationship of not only the site, but the surrounding area. And certainly um, you, the Tri-County area has some very challenging area, challenging topographical um, features. You can see here, much of the water here is gonna come down this road because of the slight berm, but we've got a tuck under garage. You know, there's quite a bit of slope moving water towards this building. And I gotta manage that load. Um, I can either move it away or I'm gonna have to change the way I configure the at grade and below grade part of the foundation to manage that water at the building as opposed to managing it at the site. What about building water? Well, um, building water is pretty simple. Um, this is a project I got called into pretty deep into the design process. And so the architect sent me the construction documents because the homeowner had, had said he wanted a building science review. And, um, you know, my, I don't know what jumps out at you looking at this building, but my question is, well, your rendering doesn't show any gutters. But your rendering, and so, yes, it's good to look at the elevation or, or this, uh, you know, three-dimensional uh, side view. Um, but the very first thing I go to after I've done soil survey and topographical map is I go to the roof plan here on the right. And my question to the architect was, your front entrance way here, which is the same as here, you've got maybe several hundred feet of roof area that is being focused right on your front door. How are you gonna manage that water? There's only two ways to manage it, right? You either gutter it to move it away from where you don't want it to go, or, so you gutter it. So here's a building, it's a sloped roof. The gutter is built into the roof assembly but the gutter is here. Here's the downspout, which is hard piped into the storm sewer system. So that's how you manage the roof load coming off this building. Now it is a bit comical because for some reason, there's a rusted out or punched hole here. So none of the gutter load is reaching the downspout. It's all running straight down to here. And the really comical thing about this is, um, this is about three blocks from where I live in Vermont. Uh, this is a big campus. It was the Austin School for the Deaf. Um, this is the maintenance building. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of ironic from a moisture point of view. So you can either move it, manage it here with a gutter, or you have to manage it at the ground. And in my climate, at least, particularly with slate roofs, gutters are an annual installation cost because of snow load. So quite often we end up managing roof load below grade. This is called an underground roof. There's a great um, you know, blog uh, article in Fine Home Building, but also a blog I wrote about how to configure underground roofs to manage the load here. But you have to manage it, you can't ignore it. Um, and many architects don't like the appearance of gutters. I don't like the way that gutters look. You spend all this money on fancy trim, you know, at the at the uh, fascia board at the eaves, why cover it up with an ugly you know aluminum uh, profile uh, gutter? It's 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 not 
you know, it's not aesthetic, but you got to manage it one place or the other. So what have we done? We've gone through at the gross level on um, how we need to look at three loads, groundwater table, which is representing hydrostatic pressure, which is really difficult to manage. Um, usually involves either a bilge pump in a boat or a sump pump in a building. Um, site surface load and then the building load is the third one we have to look at. All right, so that's all water coming down. And we learned in the first uh, session, we have to worry about water making its way up, water wicking. So uh, this is a basement with a bearing post. This bearing post is made out of wood, which is porous. It is buried onto a or into a uh, concrete floor. Beneath the concrete floor is soil. So porous wood, porous concrete, porous soil. And you can see that the wood is acting as a straw. This is a moisture meter. Um, it uses a slight electrical current. The more moisture there is in the wood, the more the moisture content reads. So the red light is on because the moisture content at the base of this column, half an inch in, because these pins go in a half inch, is almost 20%. So what does 20% mean? It's 20% by weight. That means one fifth of the weight of that wood is water. So if I took that piece of wood and cut it out and weighed it and then put it in a kiln for three days, the difference in weight would be 20%. And at about 17%, you start to get difficulty with applying uh, coatings like paints and stains. And right about 19%, you're gonna start to get uh, surface mold growth. So definitely a problem here having capillary continuity. This is a basement of a building I was working on. And what's this white dust? Sometimes this can look a little bit like mold, but it actually tells you exactly where the water wicking up in liquid form has taken on enough energy to evaporate. So the water is being wicked up the porous concrete. The wall is cold enough that the water is not evaporating. But when it got up to about here, there's enough energy in the moisture that the water evaporates. But on its way up, it was solubilizing free calcium in the concrete. And that free calcium can evaporate, right? Its heat of evaporation is probably thousands of degrees. Um, so it gets left as a crystal. So I know that water is rising as a liquid right up to this line. Uh, and you could say, yeah, we don't have basements. We don't need to worry about water wicking up. Well, you do. Um, you have slabs and crawl spaces and they're porous as well. Um, there's only two ways to stop uh, capillary water moving, rising up through porous materials. The one is a free draining space. So you can see that this no fines gravel or stone, that's a bed that can create a capillary break between the soil beneath it and the slab that's gonna be poured on top of it. Now, what about a, uh, a, a, a heavy duty plastic layer? Yes, that can work as well. In fact, quite often you'll do both. Um, but you either need to have a free draining space to act as a capillary break, or you can see in this assembly, here's the concrete foundation, here's the bottom uh, pressure treated plate of the wall assembly, and in between that, there's a, a piece of foam. It's called sill seal. And I, I put sill seal in every time I built a wall as an air sealing detail because the the wood plate doesn't have contact continuously with the top of the rough uh, 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 concrete wall. So it's put in as an air seal. I never once put it in as a capillary break, but it turns out that this sill sealer is um, closed cell spray, not closed cell foam. It's extruded polystyrene. It's a capillary break. Um, expanding polystyrene has enough open cell content that it is not a capillary break. But the extruded polystyrene um, is almost entirely closed cell, forms a capillary break. So controlling wicking is controlling water moving up. And um, it's another thing that we have to keep track of. Now, you know, building science folks often get 
accused of talking out of both sides of their mouths. Like, wait a minute, do you want things to be continuous or do you want to break them? And the answer to every building science question is yes. We want to do both. And it's a question of managing. So I put in breaks by design when I'm trying to stop something. I put in continuity when I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing, connecting things or separating them has to be a complete process. So we, we, we use continuity and breaks judiciously rather than randomly. All right, so number two in terms of control layers is managing air. And we have three things we have to evaluate when we're trying to manage air because there are three driving forces that create air leakage. The first is stack effect, the second is wind, and the third is mechanical fans. So we're gonna take a quick look at each of these. So stack effect is always stronger when it's colder. And stack effect is the, the pressure generated when you have a column of air that is separated from the outside air. And the driving force is determined by the height of the column of air and the temperature difference between the inside and inside of the column of air and the outside environment. And if there is a temperature difference between the column and the outside, um, the taller the building, the greater the driving force. And you create negative pressure at the bottom of the building. So air gets pulled in. And then there's a neutral plane in here somewhere. And then above that neutral plane, the force increases until you get warm air driven out of the top of the building. And so cold, dry air is more dense than more moist air. And if you create a column of that difference, you can get quite a driving force. So here's proof. So this building under construction, um, you look at it, you say, why did they drape the building? Well, they've got all these steel decks and they're pouring concrete topping slabs into the steel deck. Well, to do that, they've got to tent the whole building because they got to warm the interior environment up enough temporarily to pour the uh, floor decks. So they drape the building in plastic. And because it's cold outside, the plastic is being sucked in tight at the bottom and puffing out at the top. Now, the same thing is happening to this building next to it. But the column here is made out of rigid materials. The column here is made out of flexible materials. Um, you know, there are buildings in Canada, 100 story buildings where, you know, in the middle of winter, you can't pull the front door open because there's so much negative pressure. Now, in addition to the building being a column, what's in the middle of these 100 story buildings? Elevator shafts. And those elevator shafts are generally uninterrupted communication from the very lowest level, which could be a parking garage, to the very top, which is the venting required by the fire code um, at the top of the elevator shaft. Um, so stack effect can be a powerful force and the taller the building and or the colder the uh, in temperature difference between the inside and the outside, the more driving force you get. This is just another project, same thing. They draped the building to do this uh, column. This was probably an elevator shaft here as well that they were doing for this building, pulled in tight at the bottom, puffed out at the top. Now you could say, ah, that's cold climate stuff. Um, yes, you will not have driving forces that are as great as what we get in uh, colder climates, but it still can be a force that creates air leakage in buildings, even in relatively mild climates. Now, the, the, the impact of wind on your three county region is not debatable, right? Many of your buildings are going to see really high wind effects. And on the windward side of the building, we're going to get positive pressure. And on the leeward side of the building, we will get negative pressure. And that creates air leakage. And it is all a function of wind speed um, and the height of the building, because we know that down low, the wind speed is um, quite low in buildings. And the higher up we go, um, the generally the higher the wind speeds are not getting slowed down by surface effects. 
I just wanted to show you this project. Um, this is about 20 or 30 miles from the Canadian border where this is a mountain, I can't remember the name of it, in Canada. Um, they've got it fully sheathed, it's weather tight. Uh, it's blowing like crazy up there, you know, 80 mile an hour wind gusts because it's all this exposed top of a knoll. Um, can be a real important driving force. And of course, you're on the ocean side, many of you. So this can be a powerful force for air leakage. So the third one we're going to talk about is the mechanical uh, effect of air leakage. So every fan inside your building that pulls air to the outside, an exhaust fan, um, can create air leakage. So how many fans do you have in a typical building? Well, you've got bath exhaust. That's about 75 cubic feet per minute. You may have two or even three of those. You've got your kitchen range hood, which can vary from 250 cubic feet per minute to some of the downdraft gen air that might be 1200 CFM. You're now approaching a blower door uh, type of pressure on your building. Um, any atmospherically vented appliances, not very common in your neck of the woods and certainly not with electrification, but they too can create a negative uh, uh, air moving out of the building. Water heaters as well. The one that often gets missed is the clothes dryer. Um, if your clothes dryer is exhausting to the outdoors, which it should be, that's 200 to 250 cubic feet per minute when it's operating. So if you add all these up, you can get quite a bit of a negative driving force with air being pulled in to compensate for the air being pushed out. And certainly a fireplace or wood stove that doesn't have a dedicated combustion air uh, duct that also can create up to a 300 cubic feet per minute with a roaring fire. So all of these can create air leakage and that can be a problem in terms of managing energy and moisture. Well, you know, who cares? Just a bunch of fans. So this is a building I was working on. Um, had some significant indoor air quality problems. And you can see here, I've got a digital pressure gauge with one of the taps uh, measuring the outside pressure taped with this slightly open uh, casement window. And then the other tap, which is right here, is just reading the pressure inside the building. And I've got a note here to myself about all the fans that I have turned on. So I've got the uh, heat recovery ventilator running at 140 CFM. Um, I've got the uh, uh, cooktop exhaust running and I've turned on the clothes dryer. Um, we often call this a worst case depressurization test. And I'm at 18 Pascals negative inside this building. I'm pulling smoke through the wood stove into the house at this point. So if you build a really airtight house, in a way, you have to keep even better track of um, uh, the, 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 the air leakage you can create or the negative forces you can create with powerful fans. So what am I looking at here? I mean, I'm in a crawl space. I'm actually in a full, standing in a full basement here, looking into a crawl space. I'm actually doing the same thing here. There's a full basement and there's a crawl space under this section. And uh, cobwebs. So cobwebs are a poor man's air leakage indicator. Spiders build their webs where there's air movement. So, uh, you know, you don't need to buy a blower door, just uh, go looking for spider webs. They always build where they know there's air leakage. So if we know that managing air is important, so about 25% of the total heat loss or gain in the building is generally the BTUs that move with air leaking out in the winter or in in the summer. Um, the uh, how do I how do I go about measuring? And, and remember, I, I just said about 25% of the heat loss, but when you're moving air and it has moisture in it then there's the potential for condensation as well. So there's, there's two penalties with air, leaking air, um, the energy penalty and the moisture penalty. But the blower door is a very expensive fan 
with a digital pressure gauge where it, make, it, it uses the relationship between airflow and pressure to, to consistently measure how airtight the building is. So this is about a $1,500 fan, about a $1,500 pressure gauge. So it's about a $3,000 kit to be able to consistently and comparatively determine the air leakage in a building. So when I put that fan inside a shroud fitted to a door um, and I pull, at, I pull at negative 50 pascals, which is about the same as a 20 mile per hour wind, excuse me, um, it's like a wind blowing from every direction. Um, and I can use that to uh, develop a very true and accurate way of quantitatively assessing air leakage. But if I walk around the building with a uh, fog puffer or the back of my hand, I can also locate those leaks. So the blower door number tells you how much leakage the entire enclosure is experiencing but you can go around and find those leaks while you're running the blower door. And um, if you haven't used a blower door before, um, one of the first times I used it was actually on my own house where I had done the air sealing, I had done the insulating. And the first time I hooked up a blower door, I was screaming expletives because I thought I had done a, a good job. Um, there's nothing as powerful as the proof in the pudding of seeing and feeling the air leakage um, and how insidious it can be in terms of really getting a continuous control layer. So wait, I thought that doesn't, don't I use venting intentionally to create airflow? You know, um, why are we, wait a minute, if air leaking can get things wet, can't air leaking dry them out, right? If I'm, if I'm getting moisture moving into the building when there's a temperature difference inside to outside summer and winter, what about in the spring and the fall? You know, can I rely upon that airflow to dry the building out? And the answer is no, because you don't have control over it. The way that air leaks into and out, out of buildings from summer to winter, the pathways are different, different. The amount of air leaking actually during the spring and fall when there's little driving force, there may not be any drying potential to that flowing air at all. So the, 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 the confounding thing here is that if you ask a building scientist, does moving air get things wet or drive them out? The answer is yes. But you have to direct it. It's all about control. So here I have air coming in at the soffit and going out the ridge. That's intentional air movement to dry things out. But that outside air can't mix with inside air. So this dedicated pathway has to be just that. You know, it's very common for there to be a soffit and a ridge, but a lack of an air seal at the eave. Well, I do not want to mix leaking air in the summer and winter mixing with this air because now this outside air, which is cold and dry or warm and dry because of the sun hitting this roof, it has a dedicated purpose and a dedicated pathway and it's completely separate from what's going on in here. Now in this attic space, I may actually want to move some air around, you know, in the controlled space to create a, a dry space on the inside, but that circulation of air inside the conditioned space is a totally separate process than this outside air ventilation. It's true, of, uh, it's true of roof assemblies, it's true of wall assemblies. Yes, I can use air movement to dry things out, but the pathways have to be dedicated and separate. And when I see problems in buildings, you know, we, we're introducing ventilation air, expecting it to overcome air leakage. And that rarely is the case. You can rarely vent your way out of an air leakage problem. Okay, so we're working our way down this list of priorities and, and uh, continuous control, and now we're at vapor. Uh, vaping, vapor moving through air is just straight diffusion. Vapor moving through materials involves the vapor permeability of those materials. And then this last one is vapor retarders. I put a question mark here because how often do you in your mild climate need a vapor retarder? 
Um, there is an answer to that in just a second and make sure I come back to that. But um, the fascination that we have for where to put vapor retarders, particularly on the warm and winter side of a building assembly, that is totally driven by some research done in the 30s and 40s in Wisconsin. That's climate zone six. And unfortunately, we took that science, which is appropriate for uh, cold climates, and we've really muddied the waters by trying to carry that over into other climates. So building science does have to be climate tuned. So vapor diffusion in buildings. So we have here is it's hot and moist outside in the summer, cold and dry inside in the summer. We have warm moist air inside during the winter and cold dry outside. So in the summer, we have vapor pressure trying to move moisture as a gas into the building assembly to the interior. And in the winter, we have exactly the opposite. So how do we know which force to, to, to manage? Does vapor diffusion get things wet or dry them out? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. When I go to manage, I want to manage bulk water, capillary water, and air leakage first. And then I try to develop a continuous strategy to, to, to direct the flow of water as a vapor. So the, the principle here is let me control water and air as best I can. But my backup plan is if water gets into this assembly, I have to let it get out. We talked about this last time. Water can get into an assembly any of the four ways. But once it gets into an assembly, the only way it's going to come out is drying by diffusion. So Alexa, uh, Alexi, uh, Alexa, Alexandra or Alexi Basic is uh, Steve's architect daughter. And this is her drawing for a GBA blog that she wrote showing that she has chosen different types of insulation and structural systems and even claddings so that from the most restrictive vapor permeable layer, she gets drying to the inside and from that most restrictive layer, drying to the outside. That's called doing a vapor profile. I wrote a blog for Green Building Advisor many years ago on doing vapor profiles. You can look it up. It's uh, got probably 300 comments. It's a great uh, doc. It's a great resource to use to better understand how to do a vapor profile on your own wall assemblies. We're not going to do that here, but just understand that you must know the vapor permeability of each layer to determine whether or not you have drying potential built into your assembly. And remember, it's your backup plan. Manage bulk water and air first, get as best control over that. And then as security, you develop a vapor profile to manage any water that does get into your assembly. And remember, diffusion is a very weak force. Now, the, the, the one way you can kind of put diffusion on steroids is to add energy. So if I've got bright sunlight striking a wall assembly, and even more importantly, in a roof assembly, vapor diffusion drying can actually be a very powerful force if you add enough energy to the system and or you add um, <clears throat> airflow. Um, so it's always that relationship between energy and moisture. Yes, diffusion drying is slow, but if you add energy to the system, you can really uh, expand its capabilities. And then at the very end, that's when we're going to manage uh, uh, thermal flow by conduction. So we're going to look for thermal bridges and create thermal breaks. Um, we're going to look at two different strategies, insulation inside the cavity compared to exterior insulation. And then the big question is, well, how do I know at the end of the day how much insulation to use? Um, it turns out there's several different answers to that, which we'll take a look at in just a second. So I don't know how often this happens in your neck of the woods. My memory is from working on many buildings in California over the years that you have just as many 
problems with structural members moving from inside condition space to outside space without thermal breaks. Um, in my neck of the woods, it's all the timber framers. And I can't tell you how many timber framing companies I've worked with, both architects and builders, and I've told them, there is no way to move a structural member this size from the inside of the outside of the building and have it perform from an energy and a moisture perspective. And they say, yeah, but I can do a really good job of sealing right at here. No, you can't. This framing member is gonna change dimensions and move with moisture changes and with temperature changes. And you may be able to seal it airtight up on day one, but I guarantee you in two years, you're gonna have air leakage there. You're gonna have condensation. You can see here this ridge, which is for a timber frame home, the ridge extends out beyond the condition boundary. And I've got not a bulk water leak here, but I've got condensation. So the, what do you do? Well, you put in breaks. So the timber framers hate this. Build a flush box. And then if you want it to look for a timber, like a timber frame, add timber frame appendages on the outside to say, no, that's, that's fake. Well, we, we've never come up with a way that we can get continuous management of water, air, and vapor without building a flush box like this. And notice that this is a flush timber frame with continuous air and water protection. And then the overhangs are stuck on as a completely separate process. Here, Steve Basic's house, he's got continuous insulation on the outside. Um, whole separate process gives the building a very different appearance. Of course, this is not finished here. But uh, note here too, with the drawing on the left that corresponds to the structure, um, Steve has mapped out um, the continuity of the control layers. Um, here's his, oops, sorry. Here's his uh, water management system moving through uh, the penetration of the window. So the, the, the uh, concealed drainage plane is here, continuous. His exterior insulation is continuous. And then he has di directional drying of the assembly from this layer to the inside and from this layer to the outside. So continuity of all four layers with directional drying. Well, how the heck do we determine how much insulation to use? What should we be aiming for? And I told you there were three answers. So the first answer is just straight economics. Um, you, you know, the only way to accurately determine the balance between cavity insulation and continuous exterior, exterior insulation below grade, insulation above grade, insulation at the roof, how much money to spend on the R value of the window compared to the R value of the wall. You, you have to energy model that. Now, there is one of the best programs for doing this, particularly in a building where you're looking for resilience, where you're looking for it to maybe float with uh, power outages. Um, BOPT is an hourly energy modeling program, it stands for Building Energy Optimization. But this was developed by NREL, and um, the state of California actually worked with BIOP to add a module to um, add the capability of doing remodeling BIOP runs on existing buildings, which is pretty cool. Um, so you'll get one answer from an economic standpoint about how much insulation to use. But remember, we talked about thermal comfort you may not get the same answer when you add to the economic outcome, thermal comfort for the occupants. This is particularly true in commercial buildings, but it's also true in residential. Um, you, you can't always just do the straight economic answer because remember the occupants are not gonna care about the energy performance of their building if they're not comfortable in it as well. And then the third answer is that if you want a building to passively maintain livable conditions for a day or two days or even three days when there's a power outage, the air tightness and the insulation of the buildings, will there'll be a different answer for that if that's your goal. And so um, 
you have to consider all three of these when you take a look at what level of insulation should be using in your building. Now, it's always about how much you can afford, but it also depends on what your priorities are for the building performance beyond just straight uh, you know, operating costs for uh, energy. When we look at um, buildings as systems, you know, the next step is to integrate the enclosure with the mechanical systems. And this is not design the building and then stick in mechanical systems. This is an integration process. So this is from John Straub's book. And um, I can't tell you how important this is. Here are the opportunities for improvement in the performance of the building. Here's cost. And so it's, at, it's in the design phase where you have the greatest opportunity to improve performance with the least amount of cost. The, the deeper you go into the, uh, the, the production cycle of the building, the, the fewer the opportunities to improve in performance and the greater the cost. Um, and this is a big problem in our industry because we don't like to spend money up front. And a lot of this is gonna to have to be by careful interaction between the architect or the designer and the person in charge of the mechanical systems. And a lot of this has to do with building loads. Now in California, we're going after homes because it's almost a third of all the energy consumed uh, for electricity in the state of California. But it's all about the loads. So because you're in a relatively mild climate, look, over, over almost 60% of your total energy consumption is things that plug in. Well, in my neck of the woods, heating is the, the 800 pound gorilla. But when I go to look at building loads, we have all of these loads that are controlled largely by the performance of the enclosure. But once I manage these, it just makes these bigger in proportion. So over here, we have domestic hot water, appliances, lighting and plug load, all of which are determined by the number and the behavior of the occupants. So this drives architects and mechanical engineers absolutely crazy because they know how to manage this, right? They know how to integrate the performance of the enclosure with the mechanical systems to manage these loads. But in milder climates and even in harsher climates, after you manage these, you have to turn your attention to these as well. If we're gonna elect electrify buildings, um, and turn all the loads into electrical loads, we have to have a plan for addressing the loads driven by occupants. And it's hard, right? Because it's the management of these is very different than the management of these loads. All right, I get this question all the time, which is, all right, let me get this straight. You wanna make a building so airtight that I have to introduce an expensive ventilation system to bring in the outside air that I just tried to separate from. That sounds like a business plan for an HVAC contractor. Well, it is a little bit of a sort of speaking out of both sides of your mouth, but it's about control. So at some point, you don't wanna be dragging air from who knows where um, by what amounts and any type of schedule. Mechanical ventilation systems give you the right amount of air from the right location to the right locations and on a schedule to give you what you need over time. Um, so it's right back to this issue of management and control. So this is a plan view of a very simple house. You can see master bedroom, um, kitchen, family room, breakfast nook, but it's, it's a slice away, right? So this is Steve Basic's drawing. And what he's showing here is that, yes, we have to lay out these spaces properly, 
But if this is floor framing, you know, the floor joists and the carrying beams, as an architect, I need to move these loads in a way that accommodates the heating and cooling system. And if your heating and cooling is all hydronic little pipes, well, you, you don't have to do much planning or not nearly as much planning. But if you're using air, forced air, to heat and cool and dehumidify your building and to ventilate your building, these are, these are big volumes. You can't, you can't get these in willy-nilly after the fact. You have to know the size of all these ducts. And that requires a conversation between the architect who's responsible for transferring these loads, loads meaning structural loads, um, so that the loads of the mechanical engineer can be equally accommodated. So here's the four stair trunk. That's a big puppy. You've got to integrate that with the floor joists and the carrying beams. That's got to be done by design. Uh, the supply ducts, you know, they're different sizes. How do I know that they'll fit through or be able to be cut out with the floor joists? That's a conversation with the mechanical engineer or the HVC contractor. Um, supply registers and even windows because the window performance is never gonna be as good as the wall. And where I locate all of these supplies and returns is a function of the performance of not only the opaque walls, but the windows. So designing for high performance means integrating the HVC and the enclosure, and it looks like this. So this report coming out from the mechanical contractor tells the architect, well, here are all the different duct runs, here are all the different sizes. I better make sure that I have a pathway that can connect A to B to make sure that all these ducts will actually fit into the framing system. And then here it's the supply trunks. You know, this, this is the result of an architect and a mechanical engineer going back and forth, you know, using their separate expertises to make sure that the performance of the enclosure is lined up with the, uh, the, the structural loading of the building that accommodates the mechanical uh, um, equipment that's gonna meet the mechanical loads. Seriously, you mean the architect and engineer need to cooperate and speak each other? Yeah, that's a big part of this. And this is hard because there are a lot of architects who don't respect engineers, and there's way more engineers that don't respect architects. So, you know, you may have the idea that you're going to build a high performance building, and you may have it, you know, designed and spec right. But if you don't have key players that will work together and, and, uh, uh, play in each other's sandboxes, it's very unlikely you're going to get a high performance building. Okay, so we've, we've gone through this approach to performance. What does it mean in terms of establishing priorities in the three counties um, and your climate zones? So I know this is a lot of information, but I took all of the recommendations by climate zone for all the climate zones that are in the three county area. So that's climate zones four, five, six, nine, and 16. And the reference city that I used was San Jose, Santa Maria, Los Angeles um, at the airport, Los Angeles at the Civic Center, and then Bishop, California. And here are the record high and lows. Don't spend any time on that. What I wanna to get to is the climate priorities for these climates are expressed in documents that you can download for winter performance priorities and summer. And you're gonna notice a very clear pattern here. Of course, insulate every building, but a very high priority is make them more airtight. And that's largely driven by performance during the winter. But when we add to that, and, and here, here's an interesting aspect, passive solar. You want to get as much sun into the building as you can during the winter <clears throat> to reduce those heating loads. But look at the summer priorities. Shade. All right, well, 
you know, how do I get the most sun in during the summer and the most shading in the, uh, I'm sorry, most sun in during the winter, most shading in the summer? Um, it's very difficult to have one level of shading that gives you optimal performance for all four seasons. You know, the, the architectural directions for um, getting the right overhang for peak winter and peak summer, that's pretty easy, but we have a lot of buildings that are high performance that are overheating in the shoulder seasons because the, the, you, you need to establish a separate and often changeable or adjustable shading component to be able to deal with the shoulder seasons. We, we, have, we have passive houses all across the country that are running air conditioning during spring and fall because they're just getting too much sun. Um, the, the building is too airtight and too well insulated. Now, this could mean that you need to better connect your building during the shoulder seasons to the outdoors. You know, natural ventilation is on this list throughout the whole, but it's tricky. Moving buildings from environmental separators to communicating with the outdoors, that may require um, strategies that involve the occupants. I once went to a presentation by a really uh, well-known leading architect um, who did passive design. And I went into his session, waved my hand from the back. And then he started off by saying, this is a session about the basics of passive solar. And I thought, well, I can't sneak out now. But he got real frustrated about halfway through the presentation because of the questions he was getting about, you know, how do we run these buildings in the shoulder seasons? And he looked up in frustration and he said, passive buildings require active occupants. Active buildings tolerate uninvolved occupants. And that was worth the whole session right there. Um, there, there is no way to have a building that doesn't connect with the outside environment when it's proper and does without involving the occupants. It means changing the shading. It means open and closing windows. Um, you know, the, the, when we try to automate buildings to do these things, um, the automation systems just often can't keep up with the changing conditions. And I just wanna go back here quickly. Notice that over here, in terms of the recommendations for insulation values, and by the way, there's no recommendations here for air tightness levels, which I find kind of curious. But look at the importance of the glazing performance here and how much glass to put into a building. About 20 years ago, um, after a lot of hard work, um, this website called efficientwindows.org was developed, and it includes a window selection tool by climate. So if you want to know how to get the best perform performance properties matched to your climate, this is a free tool. It's easy to use. Um, I use it all the time in my work. At the end of the selection tool process, you can actually connect to manufacturers of windows and look at their models that meet the criteria of the tool. Um, so it's, it's, it's a practical tool because it doesn't just give you a hypothetical answer it can lead you to windows that you can actually purchase with those performance properties. But the key to all of this is the NFRC sticker, the National Fenestration Rating Council, where all the windows get absorbed by this, uh, get, um, all the windows get evaluated by exactly the same um, system. And note here, the U factor is the conductive performance of the glass. The solar heat gain is about how much of the sun's uh, infrared energy penetrates the building. Um, then we have the visible transmittance, the air leakage, and the condensation resistance. Now, when you go to look at this tool called the efficientwindows.org, um, you're going to find that there are unintended consequences of increasing the thermal performance in terms of visual transmittance. So don't look at these properties in isolation. You know, we can make windows that perform real well with conductance that have unacceptable condensation risk. That's actually happened to me on two projects recently in New England. Um, so we don't have time to go into it here, but this is a very powerful tool that you can use um, 
to tune the glazing appropriately to your climate. But remember we said that shading was important. So this tool is efficientwindowcoverings.org. I helped build this tool um, now more than 10 years ago. And what we did is we, we looked at all the different types of coverings and attachments. You know, we're talking cell shades, awnings, films, um, Venetian blinds, uh, uh, you, you name it. There's probably 15 different types of window attachments and coverings. Um, but we developed a selection tool that you can use to help to choose the appropriate um, uh, window attachments or coverings for what you're trying to do with your windows. And here's the crazy thing is, we, 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 we buy these very expensive windows. And the very first thing that happens when people moves in is that they put in something that changes the performance of the window. And what you put up, an exterior attachment or an interior attachment has really big implications for how that glazing is gonna perform. So another great tool set up exactly the same as the efficient windows tool um, so that they're both kind of easy to work with. Okay, so real quickly, we're gonna spend some time. Remember we talked about this building being very high performance and um, let's just take a quick look. So this house, <clears throat> um, you can, there are articles written about it, but the key thing is that when they went about retrofitting this building, they, use continuous control layers, they use the relationship between moisture and energy flows, they took a look at all the different loads, and notice that the total performance brings the consumption down to about 50% of a typical all-electric home. And the outcome here is expressed in 4.5 kilowatt hours per square foot per year. Okay, we're gonna translate that this 4.5 into thousands of BTUs per square foot per year. And we're gonna do that because every kilowatt hour is equal to 34, 12 BTUs. And the reason we're gonna do that is because th the energy use intensity is the one metric that is used across all buildings, commercial, residential, and industrial to evaluate the total energy consumption based on the size of the building. So this EUI is the most common and therefore one of the most useful full energy consumption metrics that we have. And note that if we convert this all electric to KBTU, we get 15, all right? So anything from about 20 KBTU per square foot per year or lower, means that you're gonna be able to cover 80 to almost 100% of the total load of that building with a PV system. So the, the break point for, for most buildings, including single family detached is that 20 EUI. And so this building is well below that. Um, this building is easily covering all of its load and then some with a system. So we don't just slap a PV system on top of the building, we, get the loads down low enough that we then can design the appropriate uh, PV system to meet those loads. This is another case study that we looked at, nine East Lake and Pacifica. So another extensive uh, retrofit. You can see here that it has both a solar water system and then there's a PV system uh, on the other roof slope. And I just wanted to show you this one because if we take a look at their energy bills, notice that at the end of the year, they are ahead of the game. So it's net annual zero, but, but look here at their energy bill. In the winter, they're consuming more than they're producing, but when we move into the summer seasons with better uh, solar gain, we have loads that are um, less. And so what's the EUI for that building? Um, if we add up all the electricity here used over the course of a year, um, we get 35 uh, kBTU per year. We divide it by the square footage and we're right at 20 kBTU. So that means that the PV system is, is achieving net zero because the loads match up. So we're just about right at 230. Um, I wanna just 
uh, go quickly through some key resources. Um, over 20 years of national research through the Department of Energy, it's all stored in something called the Building America Solutions Center. You can go and find climate-tuned case studies, climate-tuned strategies, um, wall sections, um, appropriate mechanical systems. Um, it, it's, it's a really cool website because it takes, you know, hundreds of thousands of your tax dollars and rolls them into one place to go looking for information about climate-tuned high-performance buildings. Building Science Corporation is a company that is one of the Building America teams. Um, they have an incredibly powerful website. Um, they have designs that work called DTW and enclosures that work by climate. Um, I have an assessment form that I use to look at every building. Um, I've translated that five page document into a series of YouTubes. So that's a good resource. And then finally, um, Green Building Advisor um, has tons of great climate to information. Um, always a growing basis because they're constantly adding new content. So these are some of my key resources I would suggest as you move from this training into trying to apply these principles to your own work. Note we have these upcoming and I think I'll let you take over, Ian. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Peter. That was really, really excellent. Um, I just want to take a second to ask of all participants, we have a closing survey, um, just to follow up on some of the questions that we asked in the beginning of the class and really how you saw um, you know, the structure of this presentation and how it benefits the work that you all are doing in your daily life. So I'm gonna take a second to launch that and I'll just run through closing. Um, and then after closing, we can uh, give people a chance to, to ask some questions if there are any out there. And if we have time, I'll go back and pull up the web soil survey. Oh, perfect. Yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I was checking it out myself. It was pretty fun to like, go from a national level and I don't know, many clicks to get exactly to where my, my house is located, but pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yep. So, yeah. So, um, you know, similar to Tuesday, we did have AIA health safety and welfare units available for this course. Um, two of them to be exact for if you completed day one and two, um, so please, if you if you left out your AIA number during registration, get a hold of me and we can clear that up. Um, but I will have AIA learning units um, reported probably by the end of today, if not tomorrow. Um, and then slides recording and then a, another follow up survey sent out to you, if not today, by tomorrow. Um, we'll include all of the resources that Peter touched on as well. Um, and then that that record or that video from day one, I'm gonna try my best to try to embed that in the presentation itself. Um, just have you know all of it cohesively together. Um, just a note for upcoming high performance fundamentals courses that our registration is live for. We have introduction to high performance buildings and careers on June 21st, and then crafting high performance enclosures, roof walls and floors on July 12th, um, both of which the introduction to high performance buildings career is designed to be the very first introduction course to this series, um, just based on course development, we chose to, to host this one a few weeks ahead, um, but really interested to have you all and get your perspective on that first course on, the, on June 21st. Um, and then, yeah, just a few of our regulars, regular scheduled programs. Uh, next week, we have home performance tools of the trade, all electric construction, focusing on heat pump water heaters on June 6th or June 7th, I'm sorry. And then a household webinar for healthy homes on June 8th. Um, next slide, please. And I just wanna reiterate, there should be a poll posted on your screen. If you could, could fill that out, that'd be awesome. We really appreciate all of the feedback we can get 
In fact, that is the intention of these um, first renditions of the trainings. We're hoping to air this, you know, realizing that the series is meant for new and incoming professionals, um, but realizing that our current network is mostly of employers, we're hoping to get as much feedback as we can from these first renditions of the training. So all and, and any feedback is um, very helpful for us. Um, you're welcome to reach out via my personal email or 3CREN, um, info at 3CREN.org. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate the upcoming classes, this will be the sequence of, of them. Um, those first three are registration is live. In fact, number two, we're sitting in today, um, but coming up would be high performance buildings and careers, enclosure, best practices, and just keep your eyes peeled for heat pump fundamentals, water heating distribution, best practices, and how to assess a home for electrification. We'll have registration live coming up for those in the next few uh, few weeks to the next month. Um, next slide. I think that was all I had. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, if there are any questions out there, the chat was pretty quiet. So I, I would hope that there might be a few, um, but if not, that is quite all right. Um, but now would be the time to, to ask and you're welcome to unmute yourself if you do have any questions um, so we can get a, a little dialogue between you all and Peter. Um, and if not, we can we can check out the um, soil survey. Yeah, I just, uh, there's one question on the subject, clarify between reflectivity and emissivity. So reflectivity is what happens initially when the, the infrared wavelengths are striking the surface. So that's the first thing that happens. Either it gets reflected, absorbed, or transmitted. But after that, um, and the energy is absorbed and the temperature, temperature of either that initial surface or some other surface rises, the emissivity is what is the re-radiation of whatever energy has been absorbed. So if you reflect 100%, then the surface won't, the, the surface temperature of that won't increase at all and there'll be no emissivity. But of course, nothing is 100% reflected. And so even if 1% is absorbed, that will eventually raise the temperature of the surface. And then as that re-radiates, the emissivity is, well, how readily does that energy move via radiation to some other surface? So it's like a two-step process. Um, and then there's another question, did you address if vapor charters are appropriate for the Tri-County area? There is no climate within the Tri-County area where you need to include a dedicated warm in winter uh, vapor retarder. So the answer to that is no. And understand that there are three classes of vapor retarders, um, class one, two, and three. I don't know if that's in your code, but it is in the model codes that are current. Um, and uh, if you were going to encourage directional drying, you'd like to avoid particularly class one and class two vapor retarders. So it's way more important that you design based upon the permeability of each layer for drying potential than it is to try to stop moisture from getting into the assembly uh, because as a form of wetting. So we've, we've had it backwards for a long time, even in cold climates. Mm -hmm. It's way more important to profile for drying potential and vapor permeability than it is to try to protect an assembly from getting wet from the inside in the winter or from the outside during the summer. We have a, a couple more that rolled in. Um, what's the durability of the below below grade water flashing system? Um, so uh, if I'm below grade and I'm using uh, a concrete assembly, then um, most architectural drawings are gonna call out for damp proofing or waterproofing. And that's pretty interesting because there is a significant difference between damp proofing materials and waterproofing materials. There's actually, an ASTM standard 
Uh, waterproofing has to do two things. It has to withstand hydrostatic pressure and damp proofing doesn't. And waterproofing has to have crack spanding capability mm -hmm. and damp proofing doesn't. So there is a cost difference between damp proofing and waterproofing, but it's relatively small. My attitude is the only part of your assembly that you only get one chance to do correctly is anything below grade. So I'm going to look to err on the side of risk averse for anything below grade. Um, now we do have drainage mat systems that in addition to creating water repellents gives free draining capability. And the dollar signs go up with all of these assemblies. So um, I am almost always looking for what's the threat of groundwater how much of the site surface water can I move away from the building? I might bring my A game if I know that there's a high water table, if I know that I am going to have a lot of difficult directing load at the surface away from the building, um, or if I can't use gutters, that all those things are going to make me use, spend more dollars moving water away from the building at and below grade. Another interesting thing about this is the code doesn't require us to do anything to make the exposed foundation concrete more water resistant. Mm -hmm. So you know, we have bare concrete in slabs. We have bare concrete with crawl spaces. We have bare concrete with exposed full foundation walls. And if the water's coming off the roof and it's splashing on the ground and it's splashing back onto your concrete, concrete's getting wet. I wrote a blog about, do we need to make our above grade portions of our foundations, whether it's a slab or a crawl or a full uh, uh, a basement, um, do we need to make them more waters? And the answer is, of course we do. And then what type of materials do we choose? So if you look for that blog, all my blogs are in front of the paywall and Green Building Advisor. Um, I evaluated three different types of uh, water resistant coatings or above grade portions of foundations. Awesome. Um, all right. And then just one more. Um, could you say more about adding insulation to 60 to 80 year old buildings? Specifically, what should be done to address moisture vapor in the modified assembly? Yeah, that's a great question. So, unfortunately, one of the answers is. The, always the safest approach to increasing um, the drying capability and the energy performance of a retrofit is to do it with exterior insulation. Um, it's also the most expensive, mm -hmm. but the only way really to get continuous water management, air management and thermal in an existing building is just do all of that on the outside. If you warm the existing structure, you make it dry more readily. And the only way to do that is to put everything on the outside. Um, and if we know that we have to improve water management, if we're gonna make less energy flow through the system, then redoing the outside of the building means I get the chance to um, do a better, more continuous, uh, whether it's just a barrier. Um, it's always easier to do continuous air control from the outside because if I do my control layer for, the, for air on the inside, then wherever there's intersecting partitions or floor assemblies, there's a break. But if I wrap the outside of the building, um, it's pretty easy to get that continuity. So the, the, the sad thing is that the best answer is also the most expensive one. Awesome. Um, thank you all. Really, really great questions. Um, Should I stop I, the share and, and just real quickly try to um, pull up the, so the web soil? Survey? Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up and just very quickly. Um, I had this problem last time. Let me see if I can... Um, find my oh i have to jump out of this sorry that's okay uh, and I'm gonna... yeah, just one one more plead with you all for the the poll on the screen here 
would be excellent to get some feedback. All right, so let me share. And here's the web soil survey. Okay, so are we looking at the? We are. Okay, so it's real simple. Start the web soil survey. I'm gonna start a new session. Okay, there's the map of the United States. Under quick navigation, pop in an address. So I'm gonna put in nine East Lake, which was one of the uh, East Lake Pacifica. Okay, hit enter. And that's nine East Lake right there. Okay. okay, so it's an aerial view. I now go to area of interest and I click on that. And I just draw as big of a box as I want to capture the soils around that cross. Okay, so now you can see the, the blue diagonal lines. That's the area that I, for which I'm going to get the soil maps. So now, after doing the area of interest, I click on soil maps. And now I can see that each of the soil types listed in the left-hand column correspond with the map. So here you can see is 124, here's 105, 121, 131. So the X for Nine East Lake is in the 124. So I'm clicking on that. And here's the soil description. So tons of information here. But the most important thing is look at the overall characteristics. And you can see here that this is all alluvial, which means it's a lot of um, drained and glaciated material often. Um, but then I want to go down here to properties and qualities. And I'm going to look at depth to restrictive feature. That's really important. More than 80 inches. That means there is no restrictive layer in your assembly. And then I'm going to look at the drainage class, well drained, excellent. Depth to water table, more than 80 inches, perfect. Frequency of flooding, none. So corker. Then I go to the top, I close this when I think, well, this is pretty close to 105 and 131. All right, let's click on 105. Another soil survey comes up, and I'm looking at the, you know, Mountain flank, hard fractured residium weathered sandstone. Here's my, um, sorry, my soil types. And then look at the slope, 30 to 75%, wicked steep, depth to restrictive feature, eight to 20 inches to, to bedrock. That's a problem, right? Capacity, the most limiting layer, doesn't trans, does transmit fairly high depth to water table. So once again, the, the key thing here is that within five minutes, I can go from uh, typing in an address, selecting an area of interest, clicking on the soil maps, and then when I click on this map, you know, printable version, and then I crank it out. So pretty straightforward. There are a lot of other tabs to explore, but the way the pathway I've just shown you is the most common. And let's see if I can. So I'm going to close this one out. And oh, this is, I'm going to close this one out. And I'm going to go and just do another quick <laughs> the one problem i've had is working my way out of a particular selection um, i have to clear but clearing just the search doesn't often work Let's see if i can get this to completely clear in any event um click on the tool type in your address select an area of interest and then look at the different soil descriptions. Okay. Awesome. That's it. All right, awesome. Yeah, I, I think I followed. I have my the outline of my house pulled up, so 
I'll take a look. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we we actually live right on a creek, so it should be interesting. Um, Judy brought up a, a good point about the poll. I made a mistake where you have to answer each of the questions to submit. So if you are having trouble submitting um, for question four, you can just choose other and question five, just click either of those. Please enter in the chat options. Um, but yes, my mistake. So that could be a, an answer. Why? People are having a hard time. Um, I'll be sure to to write that for the next next class. And uh, Ian, just quickly, um, Julie asked about could I say more about the sixty to eighty year old buildings and dealing with both moisture and moisture profile and energy profile. The, the best way I can answer this is two ways. One is go to my building assessment form. And then the video, the YouTube videos that I've done on each part of that, because you actually have to profile the existing assembly to understand the best way to change its performance. Um, and then the second answer is that's the general approach. The exact approach has to be done empirically with an actual assembly. So I, I can't. I can't give you one answer other than that one to always insulate from the outside, which is not terribly satisfying. But a large part of my work is taking the results of a building assessment and um, translating that into, here's how the assembly currently works. Here's the best way to modify its importance, its performance. I'm, I'm working on a project right now where the most important shortcoming of the building is uh, grossly improper water management, particularly at windows. So the sad thing is that even the windows that aren't rotted, they all have to come out. I mean, I, I, I think on the last half dozen projects, this question has come up of, if my windows still work well, but I'm gonna reclad and I know I have to change the way that water is managed. Can I do that without taking out the windows? The answer is, unless you face seal and, and have all your water management take place at the cladding level, mm -hmm. which is not really appropriate for your climate, um, then you have to remove the window to properly flash the window to the new weather resistant barrier. Mm -hmm. So then it gets into, well, wait a minute, you're telling me I either have to buy all new windows or I've got to take out my existing ones and put them back in. Um, so, the, so the answer to the question of how do I modify existing 60 to 80 year old buildings has a lot to do with even before I decide to insulate them, I have to understand how airtight they are and how well they've been wa managing water over time. I have to answer those two questions first before I can decide how I'm gonna insulate the building. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think we're about wrapped. Um, Peter, thanks again. That was excellent. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this evolve in another rendition and potentially the, the hands-on field portion of this will be pretty awesome. Um, I'm really happy to work with you, Ian. And great thanks questions. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great questions for, for the anonymous who submitted the homework. That was an awesome example. Um, but yeah, just want to thank you all again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Take care, everyone.